Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this uh, final um, uh, meeting of the Oxford Libertarian Society for this term. Um, Stephen Davis is a programme director at the Institute for Humane Studies, um, and he taught uh, history at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University before then, and he currently has a forthcoming book um, uh, called The Wealth Explosion, which we're very much looking forward to uh, seeing. Um, and also, uh, because we were just discussing uh, a little bit uh, before we started this talk, that in fact um, uh, Stephen Davis has recently had, a, had a, done another talk uh, at the MacArthur Center uh, in, uh, in the United States, and um, uh, I have to apologize for my handwriting, um, but, um, uh, but you can either find it by going to www.macartus.org stroke <coughs> locating ourselves historically, um, that should get you there, or it's currently on the front page of uh, Professor Stephen Davis's uh, uh, Facebook uh, page, which is um, just, uh, just search for Stephen Davis. Um, so, uh, um, so after hearing this, you'll probably be desperate to hear more from, from Stephen. And so, in that case, uh, you know you can get right up, um, you, you can get right, right, right on the internet and find uh, another another excellent talk. Um, but right now, uh, Stephen is going to talk about um, uh, well, uh, reviving the uh, label individualism. <coughs> so, um, thank you very much. Right. Thanks, thanks very much, Lee. Um, I should say the, the other part of the subtitle of that talk that I mentioned there is why we're not living in Western civilization. That's the sort of gist of the uh, talk. But I'll leave you to find out what I mean by that. Well, uh, what I want to do is to talk about, in a way, the apparently trivial uh, matter of political labels, but in fact, as I'm going to argue, I think they're very important and they have all kinds of uh, significance you might not at first sight see. Uh, and also, uh, the rediscovery, uh, through reviving a particular label, of a largely forgotten part of the intellectual and political tradition of classical liberalism, something which I think is in bad need of rediscovery uh, to the present time. And so I'm sort of, this is part of the kind of wider body of thinking I have about the need to redefine politics at the moment and the way in which a sort of redefinition of politics is in fact going on at the moment. Now, the context for this is that uh, in the last, oh, 40, 50 years, there's been a significant revival of what you might call classical liberal libertarian thinking. Uh, if you doubt this, if you think that in fact there hasn't been such a revival, there's a very simple thing you should do. You should go and read newspapers from the 1930s and 1940s. And you'll discover uh, a number of things. One is that ideas which would now be regarded, uh, even by many people on the centre or quite far out left, as being utterly outrageous and uh, shocking, were widely supported uh, and thought of as being commonsensical or certainly part of where progress was bound to lead. Ideas, for example, such as that uh, the state should uh, direct people to the kind of work that they were supposed to be doing on the basis of some kind of test that they would take at an early age, labour direction and control, as it was called, or the idea that the uh, government should have the power to uh, significantly regulate people's behaviour to the extent of uh, compulsorily sterilising large numbers of the, quote, unfit, unquote, uh, which was a widespread policy adopted in many countries during the 1920s and 1930s, uh, in Sweden, uh, this policy in fact continued to be enforced right up until the 1970s. Uh, and there was quite a scandal recently when it was discovered that as late as the early 70s, significant numbers of people who were regarded as socially unfit were being compulsively sterilised in psychiatric hospitals uh, and elsewhere. Uh, people who, for some strange reason, didn't look like a typical Swede. What a surprise. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, so as I say, you'd also find if you go back to the 1930s and 1940s that uh, ideas that were regarded, which would now be regarded as however controversial as part of mainstream discourse, ideas about free markets and individuals and the like, were regarded as simply silly or eccentric or beyond the pale. They just weren't taken seriously. So, for example, a person whom I might say a bit more about later on, Sir Ernest Benn, uh, was widely regarded as a kind of uh, silly or ridiculous figure in the 1940s when he was putting forward arguments of a kind which are now part of mainstream uh, politics, however, as I say, rebutted or attacked they may be. So there has been a considerable revival of the kind of political and social purchase and the intellectual purchase as well of what you might call classical liberal or libertarian ideas. But I think it's also fair to say that these ideas still labour under a number of significant handicaps. Uh, I'm not going to go into some of them. Um, there are subjects for other lectures such as the reasons as to why the media class, uh, which is a distinct social formation in modern societies, is very hostile to these ideas. Uh, well, I want to talk about something else, the apparently trivial matter of the name that's used to describe it. Now, before I 
In other words, if you are a classical liberal libertarian, if you're broadly sympathetic to these ideas, what is the word you use to describe yourself when people ask you, well, what is your politics? Uh, how do you define the kind of intellectual position, political position that you're coming from? Now, you may think, well, why does this matter? What does it matter what labels uh, you stick upon a particular set of intellectual and political beliefs and arguments? Surely this is a trivial matter. Well, no, not at all. Words matter. One of the basic facts about politics and intellectual life is that words are powerful. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why one of the constant features of politics is struggles and manoeuvres by political actors to capture certain words or labels for themselves and deny them to their opponents. One classic example of this, for instance, is in American history, uh, when one of the most amazing pieces of intellectual theft uh, and appropriation the people who were the anti-federalists managed to define themselves as the Federalists with a capital F, uh, which, which left their opponents, the people who were the true Federalists, reduced to the rank of anti-federalist. Uh, <clears throat> so the people who wanted to create a na powerful national federal government through the new constitution in the 1780s, uh, Hamilton, Madison and the others who met at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they took the label of Federalist. Uh, whereas the people who wanted to preserve the more decentralised form of government of the Articles of Confederation, the genuine Federalists, uh, were forced to call themselves just anti-Federalists. Uh, and that was an amazingly astute move, because it meant that the agenda belonged to the Federalist side. The other side were cast as people merely making a negative argument rather than a positive argument of their own. So that's an example of how uh, people have realised uh, the importance of labels and used them uh, in their own benefit. And what you can find if you look at it is that certain kinds of political label uh, bring with them a whole range of, if you like, a number, if you might say, of associations. Uh, you find that the words not only have a specific or precise meaning, it brings along with it a whole range of other associations, sometimes good, sometimes bad. <laughs> certain words come with all kinds of nice associations. The word liberal, for example, uh, is one that has lots of good associations. Partly because of the purely dictionary fact that liberal means like generous, open hearted, open spirited, but also because the word liberal has come to be associated with generally what most people regard as good things the disappearance of slavery, uh, growth in personal freedom of expression, freedom of personal lifestyle, and the like, things that most people think are you know, pretty good. So it's a word that tends to evoke a positive reaction in the listener. It's a hurrah word, as you might say. Democracy is another word of the same kind. Uh, it's a word that, again, has all sorts of positive associations, maybe not justified in fact, but it certainly has them. By contrast, certain words come increasingly with very bad associations, words or expressions. So, for example, in colonial America, you could call yourself a Tory, and nobody would think anything of it. After the American Revolution and American Independence, there's no way that this formerly honourable political label could be used, because to call yourself a Tory meant that you were opposed to American independence and you wanted to be ruled by the British. So a whole range of political views, in fact, uh, became almost impossible to articulate in a coherent form. I'll explain why that is in a moment. Because the label that had historically been given to them was now one that attracted extreme opprobrium. In Canada, of course, it didn't, because that's where a lot of these American Tories went. They emigrated to Canada, uh, and there was, that's why within Canada the term Tory and associated words uh, had lots of continuing positive connotations, because it meant you didn't want to be ruled by the Americans, which Canadians think is pretty good. Uh, <coughs> again, these days, if you, in the, again to use the American context, if you wish to argue for uh, decentralisation of federalism, you can't use the language of states' rights. Why? Because that's an expression which now has a lot, again, of very bad associations, because it's associated with defences of segregation, racial prejudice, uh, and racial hierarchy. So, you, if you're going to make that particular case, that's a particular label or expression you really can't afford to use anymore because it brings a whole lot of bad baggage with it. So words are not just neutral terms. Words come with a whole phrase, if you like, of historical associations, allusions, implied or commonly understood secondary meanings, which may be positive or negative. And if you get the wrong word, or if the word you would like to use which has the good associations is captured by other people, then you're in trouble. This is what has happened to people who broadly favour individual liberty. The classic word which is used to describe this position was, of course, liberal. And in continental Europe, that is still the word that is generally
this position. Uh, but in the Anglo-Saxon countries in particular, and increasingly in other parts of the world as well, such as Scandinavia, uh, it's come to mean something else. The word liberal has been captured by moderate social democrats, or increasingly also uh, managerial technocrats, who is used to mean something in fact almost the diametric opposite of what it originally meant. But what they managed to capture is not only the label, but a large part of that freight of positive associations and feel-good effects that the word has. The other reason why um, labels matter is because of the way in which they promote identification on the part of people who uh, use them or become aware of them. Suppose you have a particular uh, combination of views. Uh, you broadly favour uh, lower taxation, a, a less expansive role for government. You don't favour an extensive, you're opposed to an extensive redistributive role on the part of government. Uh, you broadly favour also personal liberty, self-determination. You are opposed to the kind of uh, intrusive managerialist um, bossiness, which is such a feature of the British government at the moment. You are opposed to the kind of nonsense that you get in the name of the war on terror, for example. Uh, you believe in good old-fashioned things like habeas corpus and uh, the right to a fair trial, the kind of stuff which apparently makes you a dangerous subversive these days in the minds of some people. Uh, what, how do you see your views as being somehow a coherent whole? Well, if there is a label out there which is associated with that particular set of views that you have, you will tend to realise that what you have got is a coherent ideology. You will have a label, an identity, that you can assign to the set of views that you have. If this isn't the case, if there is no widely understood or widely shared label available to you, you will just think, oh, this is the kind of rather ragbag, idiosyncratic set of views that I have. Uh, or it may be even worse, it may be that the only labels that are widely available are ones that do not exactly fit your combination of views. And this is very much the position I think that faces people coming from the perspective I have, and I think uh, most people in this room have, in contemporary Britain, for example. Uh, you tell people that uh, you are, for example, in favour broadly of a free market approach to economics, that you favour uh, restrictions in the scope of government intervention in economic life, and that you don't like really high levels of government spending, and they'll say, oh, that means you're a conservative. That means you must also be pretty hostile to uh, gays, certainly hostile to gay marriage. It means that you must have a highly conservative view about social and cultural norms. Uh, or you must think that, you know, the British police are the most wonderful institutions ever invented on the planet. <laughs> and that anyone who says anything critical about them is a radio commie. And then when you, if you then tell this uh, hypothetical interlocutor, uh, well, no, I don't think any of these things actually. In fact, you know, I think there's a lot wrong with the British police force and that uh, there are all kinds of things uh, systematically wrong with the way they work at the moment. I'm strongly in favour of uh, cultural um, pluralism. Uh, I favour... Uh, full social and uh, cultural rights for gay people and things of that sort, uh, then they'll say, oh, you're really inconsistent. <laughs> now, you know, the, the point is, you, you may then stand on your feet and shout as much as you like and say, no, no, you know, I have a, a, a coherent worldview which derives from you know, the consistent and coherent application of a set of principles. Uh, but in fact, the problem is uh, that the labels which people apply to particular political positions or combinations of views tend to limit their range of their conception of what the range of possible combinations is. And they will tend to typically try and force you into one of the boxes that is there rather than actually think, oh, this person is something else. Because in other words, there isn't a label commonly available that people would use to describe a consistently pro-freedom position. The same is true for other political positions, of course. This is not a problem peculiar to people with a consistently pro-freedom position. Um, it is also a problem for the, you know, some of the bad guys on the other side. Um, so, for example, at the moment, uh, Philip Blonde, the man who I think is wrong on, on well, nearly everything, actually. Um, uh, Philip Blonde. Um, B-L-O-N-D. B-L-O-N-D, yes. He, he, he is, um, well, basically, he thinks that the government should do a lot more intervening in the economy. Um, he also thinks that the government should uphold traditional and conventional Christian morality through the law and various other things. Uh, he's got a whole lot of others. He's basically, his philosophy, he calls red Tory.
is actually a Canadian label, which has a specific meaning in Canada. Uh, over here, it's regards to kind of rather deliberately perverse choice of words. But he does face the same kind of problem. Again, there isn't a convenient label to describe what he wants to leave in. Because the term conservatism, which would have described his views 100 years ago, has now come to mean, amongst other things, commitment to economic liberalism, which he rejects. And so, uh, this is a more widespread problem, but obviously I'm interested in many of the problems it affects people with a consistently pro-freedom position. Now, you may say, well, surely this is not the case. Surely there are labels that people with a consistently pro-freedom position can adopt. And indeed, there are labels that are used, but I think that all of them are deeply problematic. They suffer from some of the kind of problems that I was talking about a few minutes ago. In the US, for example, the commonly used term is conservative. Uh, I've lost track of the number of times I've met somebody who has told me that they're very conservative or strongly conservative, and after I've sort of like talked to them for a bit, and I found out what they think, I think, well, no, you're not conservative at all, you're actually, well, whatever else, other level you might apply. You've got a pretty much consistent pro-freedom position. Uh, the problem is in the United States, the identification of the word liberal with what is broadly social democracy, progressivism in the old American <coughs> terminology, has become so strong that gradually the word conservative has been picked up and used as the obvious counterpoint for people who <coughs> have resistance to this kind of intrusive managerialist political system. Uh, but there are deeply, there are all sorts of problems with this. Uh, one problem, a relatively minor one, is that there are some what you might call real conservatives, traditionalist conservatives, who are really unhappy that their label has been taken in this way and are kicking up a big fuss. But also, it does mean that uh, the waters are significantly muddy because the word conservatism has, as I explained a moment ago, a whole sort of freight with it. What does it mean to most people who understand it, even in uh, the United States, and certainly in most parts of the world. To be conservative is, as the name suggests, to wish to conserve things. It means that you espouse a political philosophy which is distrustful of change and innovation, which favours the established and settled ways of doing things, which thinks that a fundamental principle of politics should be to preserve and conserve the traditional, settled and established way of life and the social institutions and practices associated with it. Now, you know, a perfectly respectable intellectual position, but how is that compatible with, for example, favouring a relatively unrestricted and highly entrepreneurial form of free market capitalism? It's not. I've never been able to understand why people who uh, say how strongly they favour traditional established ways of life are then in favour of a relatively unrestrained free market economy because all the evidence we have uh, tells us that there is nothing more subversive of settled and established ways of life than a free market economy. Because the whole nature of the free market economy, where entrepreneurship is allowed free play, is innovations which are not only purely economic or mechanical, but <coughs> increasingly social, which have significant social effects in terms of their disruption on settled expectations and ways of life. It also means, uh, amongst other things, a commitment to or support of the idea of both the inevitability and the necessity and positive virtue of social hierarchy, as opposed to and of traditional and settled social roles, as opposed to the uh, emphasis which a consistent commitment to freedom will give you on individuality, uh, denial of prescriptive or defined social roles, roles that you are born into and which you don't significantly choose in any way. Uh, so there's an obvious kind of inherent contradiction between the historical legacy of the term conservative and its commonly understood meaning in most parts of the world uh, and the kind of political views that people who commonly use it now uh, actually have. What also, of course, happens is that you tend to get then this peculiar uh, intellectual hybrid where people manage to try and combine uh, commitment to uh, laissez-faire economics on the one hand uh, and opposition to government as well with, on the same time, uh, quite sharp or even strident social conservatism uh, and the use very often of the penal law, uh, the criminal law and the criminal sanctions to enforce certain kinds of uh, moral codes or codes of behaviour or to penalise certain kinds of social behaviour uh, of which they disapprove, which is regarded as socially damaging, uh, such as you know, using certain kinds of mood altering substances and that kind of thing. So there's something deeply problematic uh, in that regard. I think the term conservatism is also deeply problematic in a political sense, simply because of the other, some of the associations it has alienate large numbers of people who might otherwise be open or sympathetic to ideas coming from a consistent pro-freedom position. Now, what about the other alternatives? The other two labels that are used commonly, both of which I've used myself, which I've used in talks I've given this week, for example,
which I've already alluded to a couple of times, are libertarian and classical liberal. These are both an improvement on conservative, but they both again have serious problems. The term classical liberal works with academics, I think, but it doesn't work with the general public because they don't know what it means, basically. Uh, and even amongst academics, it only works amongst people who have some idea of intellectual history and know that this is a reference to the kind of ideas that are put forward by uh, self defined or identified liberals in the 18th and 19th centuries. And the term tends to imply also that what you're dealing with is something which is a, a kind of old, preserved bodies of ideas, some kind of intellectual inheritance that's been handed on in an unchanging form, rather than referring to an actual living, dynamic and changing intellectual uh, tradition and body of ideas. Uh, it implies that what you're saying is, well, here is the kind of wisdom, the tablets of stone which were you know, put forward by uh, people like Smith uh, and others in the late 18th century, developed by others in the 19th century, and that's, that this is, you know, this is the law of the prophets, basically. Who needs to go anywhere else? This is both inaccurate, because it's not true, uh, but also, again, it puts you at a huge disadvantage because the obvious rejoinder uh, is, well, things have changed since then. You know, uh, what do you say to that? The term libertarian is probably more appropriate, but again, it still has a number of serious disadvantages as a label, I think. One of them is that it's an ugly word, which I think is actually you know, not a trivial disadvantage, in fact. Uh, the more serious disadvantage, particularly in the continent of Europe, but also elsewhere, almost anyone who knows anything about what the word means, is it implies that you're an anarchist if you use this word. Uh, specifically in Europe, a communist anarchist, because that's what the word libertarian means in the European continent. It means a communist anarchist of the Bakunin or Kropotkin variety. Uh, now, and, and that is still pretty widely known and understood over there. Now, of course, it may well be that you are an anarchist of a certain but in many cases, this is not the case. Uh, and that adds a whole lot of extra confusion, because uh, if, you're, if you say you're a libertarian and you're interlocked to things, well, that means you're some kind of, you know, far-out anarchist. Uh, even if you are, you're at a disadvantage, but certainly if you aren't, you're at a major disadvantage, because you then have to waste a lot of time and effort explaining why you do actually think there is some need for government, and you're not a complete believer in state society. Uh, when you might, you know, which, which puts you again on the back foot uh, from the start. I've actually used that illusion. Uh, I keep on trying to use that expression in America, and I suddenly have to think, no, nobody understands what the hell that means. So, uh, so, no, I, just remember, I, I can't use cricketing illusions to American audiences. Probably baseball has a back. Not really. No, 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 not at all. Doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. No. <laughs> So uh, I, I did. I did tell. I, I also made the great error of saying that you know some, somebody was batting on a sticky wicket, and I sort of realised that. No. <laughs> totally lost it. Anyway, so the the libertarian also has a number of other uh, kind of negative associations at the moment. One of them is that it is understood, so far as it has any meaning at all, uh, to mean people who believe that really anything goes, uh, and this is a uh, again. A, something which puts you in a defensive posture straight away. You then have to explain in much better detail what, well, no, we don't think that. Uh, but that's a lesser problem, I think, than the main problem that Jane has, which is that simply it's a word that in the Anglo-Saxon word is just not widely understood. It doesn't have a clear, positive kind of identity associated with it. Uh, it may be that what you should do is try and give it that kind of identity, but uh, I think there are, no, it, it just doesn't seem to work, if you like. But I think that that kind of identity isn't there. Now, at this point, what I want to say is, and this is the kind of argument I want to make, really, is that there is, in fact, a solution to this problem in a way, which is that there's a term available, which historically was widely used, and which until the 1950s was, in fact, the generally understood word to describe somebody who had a consistently pro-freedom uh, position across the range of uh, areas of application, whether social life, economics, political life, and the like. And this is individualism, especially when used with a capital I. If you read, for example, Friedrich Hayek's early books, if you read his essays that he wrote during the 1930s and the 1940s, even up to the Constitution of Liberty, he typically uses the word individualist to describe his position and the kind of argument he's trying to defend. This was the commonly understood argument, uh, sort of label, I should say, applied right throughout the late 19th, early 20th century. And then, for some reason, which I'll suspect that's what why that be, might be, it just drops out of use in the late 1940s. Now, 
I'll explain in a moment why uh, I think this is in some ways a much better label and it's one that we should revive. Uh, but before I do that, say something about the actual history of the label and the kind of people and movements it was associated with. Because this is the other part of what I want to talk about, which is the need to recover a kind of forgotten part of the past history uh, of what I call the freedom philosophy. Now, the term individualism used to have a highly pejorative meaning. This is an example of a word which had originally a highly negative meaning but was then uh, captured or used by people and given a positive spin. This, by the way, is another commonly occurring phenomenon. The two classic British terms, Whig and Tory, both were originally highly pejorative terms. Whig meant a Scottish outlaw, uh, and Tory meant an Irish cannibal. Um, and <laughs> th these were originally given as like pejorative labels, uh, and the people to whom they were ascribed then took them up as badges of pride, uh, which is a common, as a commonly occurring phenomenon, actually. Uh, now, if you look at uses of the term individualism in the early 19th century, it typically means selfish, uh, antisocial, it's generally a bad word. It's a highly critical word. But starting in about the 1850s or 1860s, some people start to use it as a term of positive uh, praise. And from about the 1870s onwards, you have an actual organised individualist movement uh, in the UK, but also in Canada. <coughs> States and also in France, interestingly, which is one of the places where the word first acquires a positive meaning. Uh, the movement is associated with a number of organisations, notably one called the Liberty and Property Defence League, uh, and another one called the Personal Rights Association, which is actually a shorthand. Uh, its full uh, title is the Association for the Vindication and Protection of Personal Rights, and it's, it's a long. That particular organisation was originally set up to help campaign against something called the Contagious Diseases Acts, uh, which were a series of measures passed by the British Parliament uh, to deal with the alleged crisis of the incidence of syphilis and other forms of venereal disease in the British military. Um, and it was meant to be applied initially in garrison towns and major port towns like Chatham and Portsmouth and Plymouth, and then rolled out to the rest of the country. And the main stipulation of this was that any woman found unescorted by a, a, a man on the streets of these towns could be arrested, taken to the police station, and thereafter labelled as a common prostitute. Uh, and it was a major cause celebre uh, for uh, liberals generally in the late 19th century. And the, this association, the PRA, was one of the organisations that was originally set up to campaign against it, but it then became campaigning body against a whole range of uh, state actions. So those are two of the major organisations. There were a number of others as well. An organisation called the Liberty League, for example, um, and uh, a body more specifically associated with the uh, Contagious Diseases Act, the National Ladies Association, run by my own favourite of the 19th century individuals, a woman called Josephine Butler, uh, who is uh, remembered these days, but her views are radically misrepresented. Now, who are some of the people associated with this movement? Well, the best known, uh, and someone who, interestingly, is enjoying a bit of a revival intellectually at the moment, was Herbert Spencer. Uh, Spencer was enormously influential in late 19th century England. He was perhaps the most influential political thinker and philosopher of the time. Uh, he falls from grace very dramatically around the 1890s, 1900s, and becomes regarded as a kind of relic. Uh, and in, throughout most of the 20th century, most of the kind of scholarly commentary, when it's taken notice of him, Paul has regarded him as a kind of strange throwback, a kind of cranky odd person. He was a bit strange in this person, I have to say. Uh, but his ideas are just not taken seriously. This has actually come to change in the last few years. So a couple of really good books have been written about Spencer in the last uh, six or seven years, which have uh, seriously you know, taken his ideas seriously. Um, he's undergoing quite a considerable re-evaluation. Uh, Spencer um, is an example of the kind of consistent freedom position that I'm talking about. He is an ardent advocate of laissez-faire. He is radically opposed to the kind of growth in government uh, power and government activity that takes place in the last third of the 19th century. He's also, on other things, a strong opponent of uh, imperialism and militarism. One of the last uh, things he ever wrote, in fact, as a very old man, much at the end of his life, was a savage attack on the Boer War and the aggressive imperialist policies that Joseph Chamberlain uh, was pushing at the time uh, in the uh, Conservative government, at the time of Salisbury government, 
Um, he's also a strong supporter of uh, feminism, which tends to go for women's rights, which is another recurring feature uh, of this particular body of views. Uh, and he's uh, also uh, a strong critic, interestingly, of limited liability, which is uh, another position that is often forgotten about. Uh, a couple of other people, again, names almost forgotten now. People like Joseph Hyde Levy, uh, Auburn Herbert, uh, someone whose works are still in print, thanks to the Liberty Fund. And my own favourite, uh, the splendidly named, and I think actually quite interesting thinker, Wordsworth Donisthorpe. I mean, you've got sort of like a guy with a name like that. Uh, but he's actually an interesting person. Uh, and there's a whole active movement which is engaged in this enormous debate uh, going on from roughly the 1880s through to the 1900s between these self-styled individualists and their opposition, the self-styled collectivists, the Fabian Socialists, the Webbs, that is, uh, Graham Wallace, George Bernard Shaw and the others, also the so-called New Liberals, uh, the Hammonds, uh, Leonard Hobhouse, J. H. Hobson and the like. And the outcome of this debate, I'm afraid, is that the individuals lose it for various reasons. Uh, they're up against attack from two sides, from the one hand the Fabian Socialists, on the other side the Tory imperialists, uh, and they get squeezed out, I'm afraid to say. But this is, there's a huge intellectual wealth of argument, uh, intellectual heavyweight arguments, I might say, in that tradition of self-conscious organised individualism, which in many ways I think we need to recover. Uh, to give you some idea of the radicalism of some of these people and the way in which they apply these ideas very consistently across a wide range of issues, Wordsworth Donisthorpe, the man I mentioned a moment ago, had two very distinctive ideas. One of them was something called labour capitalisation. Uh, he argued that in a free society, uh, wage labour should largely disappear and be replaced instead by a kind of profit sharing system, which is what he meant by labour capitalisation. Uh, it's something which, um, to some extent, still survives in the building trade in the system known as the lump, labour only subcontracting. Uh, but Donald Thorpe thought that this should be applied more widely uh, and that instead of being paid fixed wages, what you should get is a guaranteed share of the net profit from the enterprise that your labour is taking part in. A very radical idea uh, and one that was widely adopted by the individualists at his time. He also ran an organisation called the Legitimation League. Now, the, this was a pressure group formed to campaign for the repeal of the legal penalties against illegitimacy. So the idea was to get rid of the legal penalties, which at that time were still quite severe, attendant upon bastardy. Now you might think, oh, trivial, but then when you start to look at the um, publications of the legislation that uh, brought out, you realise in fact they were much more radical. One of the things they published, for example, was an essay uh, called A Novitiate for Marriage, which argued that uh, what should be allowed is trial marriages with a fixed term limit, with an option for renewal. Uh, if they worked out. Um, again, obviously a very radical idea, particularly you might imagine in the context of the 1890s. Donald Thorpe himself argued at length that in fact the state should not be involved in marriage at all and that marriage should be simply a matter of private contracts between individuals which could take any form that the individuals consented, uh, which could then be enforced in the courts in the same way as any other kind of contract. Uh, Auburn Herbert went even further and said, well, we don't even need contracts, let's just have uh, agreements, but Donald Thorpe was responsible as well. The problem then is what happens when you have a, you know, a falling out or a disagreement. But the point is again, highly radical and highly consistent and coherent. Certainly not conservative uh, in any uh, uncommonly understood sense of that term. So there's a huge, I think, wealth of ideas and notions out there which are lying largely unread, I think, in uh, the British Library and elsewhere, which we need to recover. Now, finally, going back to the term about individualism, I think that the, one of the reasons why people who consistently favour freedom in their individuality, in their thinking, should adopt the term individualist as the label to describe their own position, and individualism to describe the kind of ideology they subscribe to, or the body of beliefs they subscribe to, is not just that it will be part of a process of rediscovering these ideas. I think that this term has a number of benefits uh, which it would bring to the table, so to speak, uh, and which would... Um, overcome some of the disadvantages that the other labels, potential labels I've already looked at, have. First of all, using the term individualist to describe your position makes it quite clear to the reader that you're not simply thinking about economics. If you, the great problem uh, facing, I think, many, if you like, people who support the freedom philosophy, whatever you want to call it, is that people think, well, okay, you're just a guy who likes capitalism, basically. You just like free markets. You know, you're, you're in, 
often heard people talk about the free market philosophy. Uh, this implies that really you're someone who is hung up on economics to the exclusion of everything else. Many people find this rebarkative, uh, to put it mildly. Um, and also, I think it, it gets the whole, uh, if you like, causal link wrong. Um, many people think, well, okay, you, you like free markets and you like capitalism, therefore you are opposed to government. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, that's got the causal link the wrong way round. I don't like government power and political power, therefore I tend to favour free markets and capitalism. It's, it's a consequential thing arising from a, a predisposition in favour of individual choice and against organised power that leads me to favour markets, not the other way around. Uh, now, if you say you're an individualist, if you describe your philosophy as individualism, it becomes very clear that you're not just concerned with matters to do with economics, to do with economics and economic affairs. Uh, it becomes quite clear that you're <coughs> thinking about wider cultural issues, social organisation, social arrangement and the like, because the term individualism is commonly understood to refer to more than just economic matters. It implies a particular kind of lifestyle, a particular approach or attitude to life, a particular approach to social organisation, ways of living, uh, and so on. Uh, all of which you know, are in many ways positive connotations. It certainly means that you know, it clears up a major kind of confusion. Second advantage for this term is that it's very definite, uh, and it has a wonderful effect of winding up the opposition. Um, it makes it very clear where you are coming from. In some ways, it's a rather provocative kind of label to adopt, uh, because it, it, it emphasises uh, your philosophical position, if you will, the kind of attitude that you're bringing to the table, as much as it does uh, any kind of particular concrete political persuasion. And it's going to make it very clear who you are not in support of. Uh, now, the interesting question would be to ask how many people would be prepared to self-define themselves as collectivists today. Some people, for example, Sunder Katwal, the current uh, Secretary General of the um, Fabian Society, is very clear that the ideas he's opposed to in both the Labour Party and elsewhere in British politics are what he describes as individuals, and he's arguing, he says, for a principled collectivist position, which, you know, and good for him, that's a very honest and clear thinking uh, way of approaching the matter. Uh, it would be interesting, I think, if the word individualist returned into common political discourse to work out and discover, A, how many people would identify with that and how many people would, in fact, explicitly uh, identify themselves with the alternative of ethical and cultural collectivism. What this also does, of course, is to raise the whole question of what collectivism is. And one of the things which it also makes clear is that there's more than one kind of collectivism. Because when you start to think in terms of individualism, you come to realise that the opposition, if you will, the contrast, uh, the contrasting category of collectivist, is not a simple one. Uh, a common kind of unexamined notion of contemporary political discourse is that if you favour economic and political collectivism, you must be also broadly socially liberal, which when you think about it is simply historically inaccurate and also intellectually not true. In fact, historically, the most popular and politically successful form of collectivism has been what you might call right-wing collectivism a species of collectivism which connects um, economic collectivism to strident nationalism, strong emphasis on a particular ethnic identity, and things of that sort. The kind of thing which in a more extreme form manifests itself as, say, fascism, but which has historically been uh, a dominant kind of politics in a much more moderate form, obviously. Uh, and I think if you start to emphasise the, the notion or concept of individualism, it becomes aware that, for example, you become much more aware, for example, that people who think that individual uh, life plans, if you will, should be subordinated to some kind of generalised collective uh, set of principles which society as a whole somehow mysteriously generates, that these people are as much collectivist as the most uh, left-wing socialist. And a third benefit, uh, which in a way is related to the first two, is that it, the concept of individualism makes clear the connection between uh, politics in the wider sense and issues or uh, questions that are not commonly thought of as political. Uh, I did mention the fact that most 19th century feminists, for example, were individualists. That is not a coincidence. Uh, one of the interesting facts at the moment is, I mean, somebody who is undoubtedly an individualist, or whatever else you may think about her ideas, is Ayn Rand. One of, the, one of the parts of the world where Rand is most popular, interestingly, is the Indian subcontinent. Now, why is that? Well, my own take on this, my own reason, explanation of this, I should say, is that 
there's a sharp contrast between individualist ideas there and the enormously powerful emphasis in the predominant culture of the Indian subcontinent on the duty. And the idea that you have all kinds of duty-based obligations to your family, uh, your wider social grouping, uh, which override your own personal happiness or your own personal life projects. Uh, so a very strong part of the whole, uh, even like cultural uh, world there, is the notion that really you should not think about your own ideas of what you want to do with your life or try to determine your life yourself, much less make your own happiness or fulfilment the goal of your life. You should be bound instead by the kind of duties and obligations you inherit by virtue of your being born into a particular family or into a particular uh, social or cultural or religious grouping. And that's why, therefore, the concept of individualism is both very powerful and subversive, but also very appealing, as you can imagine, to people who don't quite fancy uh, you know, immolating themselves on some kind of pyre of duty. And uh, what this brings out, I think, is the way in which there's a kind of connection between uh, personal and personal <coughs> in the sense which you get with this. Now, for all these reasons, I think that there are many benefits to be gained, uh, both in terms of recovering an intellectual tradition and also in terms of uh, having a punchy, powerful label which raises all sorts of interesting and positive connotations as well as for some people negative ones uh, in using the term individualism to describe the consistent pro-freedom philosophy because it is after all individual liberty that most of the people who uh, adhere, adhere to these views are seeking to advocate rather than collective liberty of some kind or other. Uh, before I kind of conclude, uh, there is one obvious kind of rejoinder. People will say, well, doesn't this mean also hope that you're going to revive those original associations of selfishness and concern for your own personal uh, well-being at the expense of the wider collective. Uh, this in some ways is obviously a problem, but I think it also presents a great opportunity. It, it gives you the sort of enormous opportunity to emphasise a different model of social um, organisation, if you will. Uh, the voluntary principle, the principle of free association, voluntary combination, voluntary association. Uh, which is the other side of the individualist coin, of course, uh, which is why the term voluntarism is also commonly widely used in the 19th century, the voluntary principle, as it was called, which is originally termed from ecclesiology, by the way, which was then adapted to uh, give it a wider social application. Uh, and in a way, by actually raising that issue, it also provides uh, an intellectual opportunity, which is the opportunity to also put across another idea, which I think needs to be significantly more emphasised than it is, which is the importance of voluntary relations other than the purely contractual or commercial. Uh, you know, there is a kind of notion at the moment, which I must say a lot of people do let a lot of weight to, that all they think about is the famous Carlylean cash nexus. Uh, and if you actually start to emphasize other kinds of voluntary cooperation, uh, then you're going to be likely to overcome that or to rebut that, I think, misconception. So I hope I've given you some sort of notion about why I think, uh, first of all, um, labels matter and words matter in politics. And secondly, I think, uh, you know, at least put the seeds in your mind that you should adopt this particular label as a describer for your views to the extent that you have those views, uh, or indeed for the views of other people <coughs> who don't share those views, uh, and that this is in indeed a word that we need to revive, and a word that I think uh, would be a very powerful and effective political label given the kind of culture in which we now live, uh, since I think there has been, in fact, in some ways, a significant move in the direction of cultural individualism in the three or four decades since the, well, five decades now, since the 1970s.